we will hold all questions because we do have such a large group till the end and we ask that you write those down on the note cards and event and and the other team members or staff members will come around and collect those um, our first presenter this evening is dr. Roy Meckler I've had the honor and privilege of working with Dr. Meckler since about 2003, and he's taught me a lot about how I practice and about MS. One of the first things he taught me was um, a patient that wasn't doing very well back in the days before, and we really had a lot of experience with our DMTs. And I said, is that really gonna help Dr. Meckler? And his response to me was, we're gonna give them hope. And I always will remember him teaching me that, to always provide hope to our patients. Dr. Roy Meckler is a neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and neural ophthalmology. He's also a neural ophthalmologist. Prior to joining Nor Neurological Services, Dr. Meckler worked as a neurologist with the Louisville Neurological so Associates and then with Jewish Hospital for over, the, over 30 years. He was a co-founder and medical co-director of the MS Center, now known as the NNI Resource Center. Dr. Meckler is a graduate of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, where he has subsequently completed his neurology group residence. He's a Harvard fellow, but he's not very smart. Uh, com completing his neurological residency, uh, he's Harvard com trained, completing his fellowship training in neuropathology at Massachusetts General in Boston. He also is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and the North American Neural Op Society. He's board certified in neurology. Dr. Magla has a research background in myelin disorders. Uh, his topic today is treatment dis discussions at <coughs> MS and how the considerations that we have when choosing therapies for patients. Dr. Meckler. Can you all, all hear us? Could you hear me in the back? Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here for you. I know uh, quite a few of you, and uh, what we're going to do is really get back to the uh, basics and uh, perhaps some of the original thought processes that may or may not have uh, entered into your choice of disease modifying therapies when you initially were diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, your discussions that you had with your doctor. I think that the very first uh, treatment decision in MS uh, has to do with your establishing uh, your relationship with your treating neurologist <clears throat> so that uh, you feel comfortable sharing concerns, uh, make sure that you get uh, responses, uh, and then to be able to integrate it into uh, uh, choices. We're more and more driven by patients' decisions and less paternalistic uh, practices in medicine. We don't tell you what to do. We share with you information the rationale for making some of these uh, decisions and make the decisions together. Whoop. Let's see. So the first decision, uh, which is becoming increasingly complex, <clears throat> it was easier when we had only four platform drugs for treatment of MS. Now there are 15 up and running, and as you'll learn, more on the way very, very recently. So what we want to do is have the right therapy for the right patient at the right time. <clears throat> I want to uh, reiterate to you that uh, the uh, main reason that we want disease-modifying therapy uh, and the fact that we do not have a cure for MS, none of, the, none of these are curative. Uh, MS is a lifelong disease at the present time, but the whole purpose of any therapy as it relates to MS is to decrease the number of relapses, to increase the interval between relapses, decrease the severity of a relapse, decrease the time to disability, uh, decrease, um, the, uh, uh, decrease the incidence of conversion to secondary progressive MS, um, and uh, to decrease the total uh, burden load uh, of uh, changes in your brain as imaged by MRI or new or enhancing uh, MS uh, plaques. Uh, my prejudice is aggressive therapy as early as possible. Some of you may be aware, listening to other 
presentations or the reading that you've done is there's a disorder called clinically isolated syndrome, CIS, and we have criteria uh, that we have to use to make a diagnosis of MS, and these are people that will present with a symptom that is very typical of MS, have some changes on their MRI imaging suggestive of MS, but don't feel, fulfill all the criteria. But if, if you have brain changes, the likelihood of having a clinically definite diagnosis of MS is well over the 80s. And there's no question on prospective studies, initiating therapy early increases the time it takes to make a di diagnosis of clinically definite MS, decreases the plaque burden, and, and decreases the uh, relapse rate and increases the interval to uh, relapse so that uh, I'm very, I'm very uh, a true believer in therapy. Now the question is, what's the right therapy? And it's got to be individualized. There isn't any one absolute uh, MS drug that uh, is the only drug to uh, initiate. First of all, we have, we did, a lot of the uh, endpoints have not been the same. And the only time you can say, I know I have a lot of my patients ask, well, which drug is the most effective? Unless it's a head-to-head -head comparison, you cannot say anything, even if they're using the same criteria or endpoints to measure success. And there have been some head-to-head -head studies, but not very many. Uh, pharmacy companies are a little fearful of uh, results like that. Um, the, uh, we do have an evolving uh, uh, treatment landscape. Uh, in 1993, the very first drug that really has changed uh, outcomes in MS uh, was uh, uh, available on a uh, um, lottery basis, and that is Beta Zero, 1993. It was made available for purchase in 1996. And at the same time, uh, uh, Copaxone, uh, a uh, non-interferon, uh, was uh, marketed. And then subsequently, uh, as the timeline went on, uh, Novantrone, which we uh, don't use very much, which was used for uh, secondary progressive uh, MS predominantly, Rebif, another injectable high-dose, high-frequency interferon, Tysabri became available in 2004, a, a monoclonal antibody, and a lot of the new developments are extending a different variety of monoclonal antibodies with different me mechanisms of action. And then Extavia, um, uh, which uh, was the same as beta serone, uh, just a lot cheaper, uh, and made by the same company on the same, on the same uh, pharmacy line. Uh, Jelinia, um, uh, I'm, uh, Jelinia, the first oral drug available in 2010, and then second oral drug, Abagio, third oral drug, Tecfidera, and we're going to hear one of our other presenters outline uh, all these, these drugs. You, um, and, uh, and then three times per week, 40 milligram Copaxone dosing, um, Plegridi, which was uh, a subcutaneous form of, of Avonex, uh, Lemtrada, another monoclonal antibody, uh, uh, and, uh, and then a uh, generic form of uh, Copaxone. It is important, it's not just scientific or curiosity, you want to know what the mechanisms of action are because of uh, help in selection. Some mechanisms of action uh, may be, uh, have contraindications for you uh, or side effect profile, and there, there may be uh, some comorbidities that you have that can be benefited from uh, one or the other. Um, and how do we characterize uh, the patients? What are their clinical needs? Uh, what's your disease stage? Are you newly diagnosed? Have you been chronically ill? Uh, have, have you, what kinds of other drugs have you tried or failed? What's your medical history or comorbidities? For instance, uh, there's a higher incidence of depression in MS patients. Uh, it turns out that one of the side effects of a group of uh, disease-modifying therapies, the interferons, 
can exacerbate depression. So if you have significant depressive illness, perhaps choosing an interferon, even though you like the side effects uh, or safety record, uh, may not be so good. And what are the individual needs? Insurance seems to push us now more than it used to. And what are the risks of the drug versus the benefits? How effective is it versus what is its safety record or, or side effect profile? And lifestyle uh, 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 and uh, cost to you uh, is important. That is, if you're a young childbearing woman and want to have family planning early, there are a group of drugs that may not be such good choices uh, for you. And how do you, do, how do you characterize the disease-modifying therapies? What's its efficacy profile? That is, how effective is it in reducing the number of relapses compared to not being on a drug or, or the interval between relapses? Uh, what's the immunologic approach of, uh, or mechanism of action? And they're, they're different for, for uh, the uh, drugs. And in, in, in addition, the, even though some a drug may be within a class of drugs like a monoclonal antibody, the, the lymphocyte subset that it, that it suppresses may be different. And what is its safety profile? Uh, that is, have there been reported deaths on the drug, uh, significant uh, immunologic suppression so that serious infections are a concern? Uh, what's the exit strategy? For instance, probably the, just right now for easily available drugs and, and drugs that have been around, uh, the, uh, w the most effective therapy right now but at a risk is, is uh, Tysabri, uh, a monoclonal antibody. But what people don't realize is that once you've been on Tysabri for a while, when you stop it, there's a rebound risk of having a major exacerbation three month, within three months after, after stopping. So you have to think of that and you have to think about what does being on a drug, how does that limit choices for selecting another drug uh, are, are, and there, some of those those things do uh, exist. Uh, so that first thing, as a patient, you want to ask yourself is, what's my risk tolerance? That is, how much risk am I willing to take if something gives me a slightly increased edge in control of my disease? Am I willing to risk? Something. It's one thing to risk um, a skin rash. It's another thing to risk uh, uh, an infectious illness that may kill you. Uh, and then what's the immunologic impact? Some of the drugs have less of an impact on your immune system uh, than others and uh, your immune comp competency. And uh, medical history, uh, for instance, some of the drugs uh, have a higher incidence of affecting liver so that if you had, for instance, hepatitis C or you had uh, hepatitis B or some other liver, NASH, non-alcoholic steatorrheic hepatitis, uh, uh, a little fatty liver but they have elevated liver enzymes, there are a class of drugs that may not be a good selection for your first uh, drug or if you have um, uh, some hematologic disorders. Uh, uh, and uh, what is the risk of disease uh, or breakthrough? Um, and uh, disease-modifying therapy safety profiles. They're available in those little patient uh, uh, inserts in the, with the drugs, but those are tough to go through. They should be discussed in general, and you'll hear Jennifer uh, Patterson go through some of these things for individual drugs. Not all 15 of them, but in a selected uh, a disease, so that what there are some clues though as to who is at who you need to be more aggressive with. Who is we have some criteria for what your risks are for aggressive disease or bad outcomes. That is, if you've had more than two relapses within a year, the relapse frequency is a, a factor in assessing risk. The interval between relapses, the severity of the relapse whether you've had a complete or an incomplete recovery from the uh, relapse, uh, your, uh, whether you've had uh, cerebellar uh, uh, presentation affecting bowel and bladder, whether you have uh, MRI evidence 
of uh, brain stem and spinal cord uh, lesions, uh, the, whether your uh, IgG index in your spinal fluid is above 1.0, whether you're an African American a male or over 40 years of age. All of those things are risk factors and which would push you a little bit more to electing a, an, an aggressive approach, uh, taking perhaps a little more risk because the projected likelihood of a good outcome is, is uh, less. And uh, the other thing that uh, uh, we want to know our uh, disease stage, your treatment history, uh, demographics. Do you have a uh, partner and, and caregiver support that's going to allow you to be um, uh, not compliant? What's the other one? Adherent. Adherent to, thank you, adherent to uh, therapy. That is, are you going to be able to self inject? Are you going to be able to inject repeatedly if you have an injectable? Will you take your drugs? Will you get follow-up laboratory studies to uh, measure uh, safety? Uh, what are your What's your family planning? How active? What is What are, What uh, What are your uh, work requirements and and uh, perhaps some of the um, side effects of the profile that might uh, inter interfere with that? And uh, comorbidities can add to the complexity of MS. Um, and in the general MS population, 30%, 37% have at least one physical co comorbidity, and 48% have more than one mental comorbidity, like uh, anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar disease for mental, um, for physical. Uh, there's an increased incidence of mitral valve prolapse. Actually, the MS population tends to be healthier statistically than general population. There are some things where there's a little bit more, have a higher incidence of uh, migraine, uh, have uh, uh, um, um, <laughs> memory, problems. <laughs> memory problems, right, thank you. <laughs> that, is, that is something, that, that, is, it, that is an interesting consideration though, is everybody focuses very, very much on the uh, physical aspects of their of MS and their disease, not realizing how prominent over time uh, changes in in mental status are. E even though you're in a in a wheelchair, you can get from point A to B. But if you if you can get to point A to B without even a cane in your hand, but you don't know why you need to get to point B, it can be more disabling. And some of the some of the drug profiles have a better. Uh, track record for preservation of uh, cognitive function and, and, and ways of uh, measuring that. Let me see, I think that is it for me. And we're going to have time to handle uh, uh, questions and answers. And so that there really is a very, there's a lot of very basic things that a lot of us, both as patients and doctors, take for uh, granted that really you need to revisit again. And uh, Deborah Lockridge is going to talk about why people want to switch drugs or, or what criteria there are for switching drugs, which is a very difficult, it's a much more difficult decision process than electing therapy. I hope I've convinced you that there's no question therapy is good, earlier, more aggressive, better, um, but it's a very individual process there's no one single drug that's right for everybody and that's got you've got to be thoughtful about your choices and you have to be open and have a good line of communication with your physician but you're part of the process thank you thank you dr. Meckler that was great um, my next presentation will be by Jennifer Patterson and just a reminder you guys if you have questions, you might want to write them down because we all have cognitive problems, right? You might want to write them down as, they're, as we're moving along as you're thinking of them because you might forget by the end of the presentation. Um, Jennifer Patterson is an MS certified advanced registered nurse practitioner with Norton Neurology Services at Norton Suburban. She received her undergraduate degree in nursing as well as a graduate degree in healthcare administration from Spalding University. She received her nurse practitioner degree from University of Louisville 
She has worked as a critical care nurse in transplant ICU, trauma ICU, and neurosurgical ICU, as well as the emergency room. She has cared for MS patients in the past almost nine years, probably more than that by now. She is very involved in the MS community, both locally as well as nationally. She has been employed as a nurse practitioner with Norton Neurological Services for the past f almost five years. One thing about Jennifer is that she's so passionate, I hate to hear her coming down my hall, very intense, because she's very, very passionate about her patient care, and I know she's got something for me to do. So, so here, welcome Jennifer. Thank you, thank you. And that is a true story. I do search Robin out as well as Cheryl. Cheryl hides and shuts the door sometimes. All right. All right, so those of you that know me know I could stand up here for an hour and a half and cover um, what I'm about to cover with in 15 minutes, so Robin says. So clearly, I'm going to touch on the hot points with some of these more, um, some of the newer products and the things that we're using a little bit more. We all have been around in the injectables. We've heard about that and know, but I am going to cover some of the newer products. Again, you do have the slides that have a little bit more in-depth information, so I may not hit on all of that, just kind of the hot points um, as we talk about it. And like Dr. Meckler had said, it's really a good environment that we're at with MS right now. You know, we've got more options and we have more products to look at. So when we feel like you're failing or not doing quite as well as we would like on a product, now we can look at other options. So it's really important as a patient, as a caregiver, as a support system, that you are educated on what's out there and what's available so that you can go into your healthcare professional with good questions and with the intent to figure out you know, is this the best product for me? Is there something else that may help me a little more? So we're going to cover several of the orals, you know, the three orals. The first one that came out was Fingolimod or Gelenia. Been on the market for commercial use since 2010. So kind of the high point with this one is, this is the one that can potentially affect your heart with the first dose. So when we all talk about it, that's the first thing you think about. Oh, wait a minute, I have a history of heart disease in my family, I can't take that. Or, you know, maybe I have high blood pressure, I can't take that. And that's not always necessarily the case. Sometimes it is, but this is one, the most common potential risk associated with this, with the first dose, is it could lower your heart rate. Now typically if we see that, we're only going to see it with the first dose. It's not something that extends for a long period of time, and usually if it's going to happen, it's within the first few hours, uh, usually four to five hours of taking the first dose, typically resolves by that sixth hour because this is a potential with this medication. We do require that you be monitored for that first dose. And this is something that could be done in your healthcare professional's office. It could be done in an infusion center. Um, depending on your insurance coverage, it could be done in your home. But nonetheless, you do have to be monitored. And you're gonna get some preliminary testing done. We're gonna check some labs, and we're gonna see where your immune cell counts are. Now the reason is, the way that this medicine works is all of the medicines I'm gonna talk about, they affect your immune system. Uh, significantly different way than what the injectables had affected. Now this particular product, it holds some of your lymphocytes, which are part of your immune cells. And those are the ones that we feel like are most commonly involved at doing damage in your central nervous system. So this medication, it kind of holds them hostage in your lymph node. So as they're out circulating around and become activated and then want to get into your central nervous system and cause damage, this medicine does not allow them to get through and get out of the lymph node. So if they're stuck, held hostage in your lymph node, they can't be in your central nervous system chewing away at that protective covering on your nerves called the myelin. So because it does that, it could lower your immune cell count that's circulating, which in turn could potentially increase your risk of certain infections. So we're gonna check where your immune cell count is before we start you on therapy, and then we're also gonna check your liver enzymes because this medication is metabolized through the liver. We're gonna look for signs of certain infections such as varicella. I wanna make sure that you do have antibodies to that before we start so that we can monitor for that as well. Now while you're on therapy, because again, I'm affecting your immune system, I'm gonna monitor some of those labs periodically. 
Um, the biggest side effects of this medication, you know, with anything, if you read the product insert on any product, um, most things are going to say could potentially cause some diarrhea in the beginning, could cause some nausea, could cause some headache. This really isn't different than that. Um, but again, the biggest thing that we watch for is some of the heart-related issues. Um, we also want to watch for a certain condition that could affect your vision. So there was very few patients in the clinical trials. Um, I believe it was 0.3% in the placebo group, 0.4% in the Gelenia treated group that experienced a condition of their eye called macular edema. And basically what that is is a swelling on the structure in the back of your eye um, opposite the optic nerve. So usually if you have this condition, we typically see it a little bit more commonly in people with diabetes or people who have had inflammatory problems in the eye before, but if you experience it, it could be a change in your vision. Typically not painful, but that doesn't mean it has to be that way. So that's something else that we're going to monitor. Um, PML, I will make a comment about this. PML is the brain infection that is typically associated with Tassabri. However, we have seen some cases um, associated with Gelenia. I believe there have been five cases currently um, that have been put as probably related to Gelenia, but that's out of around 135,000 people. So very low incidence, however, is worth mentioning because that is something that we monitor um, very carefully for and we take very seriously with all of our products. Um, but I will say this has had some association. So teraflunamide is another oral product. This is the second one that came to market, October of 2012. Now the interesting thing with this one is it's been on the market in the United States to treat another condition called rheumatoid arthritis. The rheumatoid arthritis product is called luflunamide or Areva, whereas our product is called teraflunamide or Abagio. So when the rheumatologist gave this product, you, know, you would take the luflunamide and it would be broken down in your liver to the active ingredient of teraflunamide. And that's what we have. So a little bit of a cleaner product, but nonetheless the same parent um, compound. Now this one also works to affect the way that your immune cells work. However, with, um, with Gelenia, where we see a decrease in the lymphocytes that are circulating, this one works very differently. So it's not as suppressive um, as we think about Gelenia. The way this one works is when your lymphocytes or those immune cells become activated, um, this pre or it prevents them from um, from doubling, from getting increased number of activated cells. So this one works that way, um, not as suppressive. So we don't see a significant drop typically in your um, white blood cell count or your lymphocytes. However, you could have a small drop. In the clinical studies, when we saw a drop in your lymphocyte count, it was still within the range of normal. So it did not typically drop outside of that normal range. Because of that, in the clinical studies, we also didn't see a huge increased risk of infections. Um, staying with the PML discussion, this medication hasn't been um, indicated as causing PML. However, it's not been out that long. And I will say, for fairness sake, that luflunamide, which is the rheumatoid arthritis product, has had some cases of PML, but those patients were also on concomitant immunosuppression. Um, when the rheumatologist use Areva, they use it with another immunosuppressive agent, such as methotrexate, which is an oral um, chemo medication. So the biggest issue with this, the one that we talk about a lot when people come in and considering this, is number one, you know, what is your family history? What's your family lifestyle? So if someone has comorbid rheumatoid arthritis, this may be a very good option, because perhaps we can kill two birds with one stone. The other thing we have to talk about is what's your family planning situation? Are you considering um, becoming pregnant? This does carry a pregnancy category X rating on our current pregnancy rating system, which means 
basically we don't have data for human studies, but based on animal models, it looks like there is some signal for issues during pregnancy. So this medication is definitely not indicated for use if you are pregnant, planning on becoming pregnant, or breastfeeding. Now another interesting thing about this medication is it's one of the only agents that we have that we can actually eliminate from your system rapidly. So if you were to tell me, because you're not going to accidentally get pregnant, no one ever does that. Ever. Man's name Max. But if you come to me and say that you really are ready to start thinking about having a child and becoming pregnant, I can eliminate this medication from your system in 8 to 11 days. But what else I can do is I can do a blood test that's free and covered by the manufacturer to see how much of the medication has been removed. Because one thing about this medication is it does have a very long half-life. So with that being said, the vast majority is going to be in your system for about two months. We're going to see traces of it for about eight months, and there may be small, minuscule amounts for even up to two years. So if I needed to get it out, because you were pregnant, planning on becoming pregnant, or perhaps you had elevated liver enzymes, because this is metabolized through your liver, we could do that. Side effects, again, the biggest one we look at is potential for elevated liver enzymes. Another one that's a pretty hot topic with this is the thinning of your hair. So this is listed in the product insert that it could potentially cause some hair thinning. This does not mean you're going to go bald. This does not mean you're going to have bald spots. What it means is for whatever reason, we see an acceleration in the shedding process. Now typically, we shed a certain number of hairs per day, depending on your ethnicity, your nationality. On average, it's somewhere around 100 hairs a day for women. Um, for whatever reason, this product, as well as the rheumatoid arthritis product, accelerates that. So about 13% of patients on this medication may see an increase in the number of hairs in their shower, in their brush, on their pillow. If it's going to happen, usually happens around three months on drug and then resolves within a couple months. So that's something that gets hit on a lot. So Tecfidera, that's the third pill that was approved in the United States to treat MS. This is a novel product for the United States, however, is very similar to a product um, that was used to treat psoriasis called Fumiderm. Now this product is a twice a day medication, has to be taken twice a day. So if you're one of those people that forgets to take pills um, and maybe has maxes or things like that from forgetting to take pills, you know, this is something that you have to consider with this medication um, because it is not effective. It's a very short half-life. So that's something that needs to be thought of when you're thinking about what product's gonna be best for you. Now the way this one works, again, is completely different from other medications that we have, but we feel like that this one increases some of the pro-inflammatory cells. Um, we do see benefit from decreasing oxidative stress, and, and there's also some thought that it causes some neuroprotection. So great mechanism of action that, again, is novel and different from anything else that we have. Most common side effects with this medication is flushing. And this is not, you know, it, it's not that you're going to be, you know, itching halves necessarily, but some people do have that. Most commonly what it is, is within about 15 to 30 minutes after taking the medication, you may experience some heated sensation, some redness, specifically in your head, um, chest area, may have a little itching. Usually that's not long lasting typically 30 to 45 minutes and it improves. There's also things that we can do to help to mitigate that symptom so it's not so bad. Certain over-the-counter medications that we can use, even some prescription medications. Um, a big one is making sure that you take the medication with food. And when I say with food, I don't mean with a piece of toast in the morning. It needs to be a full meal, something that has fats and carbohydrates to try to minimize that effect of the flushing. Other side effect that's most commonly seen with this is some gastrointestinal complaints. And that may be nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, any of those. 
Um, it's certainly not all of them together, but we do see a, a vast degree of some gastrointestinal side effects. Now, usually these side effects that we see are only the first month, and they tend to improve with time. Um, after the second month, it's really a lower incidence. Some people are different. Some people have them a little bit longer. But again, that's something that you can talk with your healthcare professional about, because we do have good strategies that can help minimize some of these side effects, especially if it's something that's working for you. So because of the mechanism of action and the way that it works on the immune system, again, there is some concern for potential infections. Um, we have found that a certain subset of patients, certainly not all of the patients on this medication, but there are some that can show some significant reduction in the lymphocyte counts or the immune cell counts. Anytime you lower those immune cell counts, you run the risk of infection. This too has been associated with a very few cases of PML. I believe to date there's only four cases associated, and I wanna say the number of patients on this is somewhere around 155,000, give or take. I think that's the most recent number that I was given. Um, so it's a low incidence, but nonetheless it is a concern. And again, like I said earlier, it is something that we take seriously. Because that's a risk, we're gonna to wanna to check your blood count before you start the medication to see what is your baseline lymphocyte count. And then periodically while you're on the medication, we're gonna continue checking that. Um, if you were found to have a low lymphocyte count, you know, especially if it stays low on routine checking, we may discuss other treatment options because at that point, you, know, you are gonna be at a higher risk for infection, including PML. So moving on to the IV infusions, you know, Tassabri is the next, and it was approved originally in 2004, was only on the market for a few months before it ended up being taken off for further review, and then was re-released in 2006. The reason it was taken off the market was to investigate PML, the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. This is the product that we use the most that has the highest incidence. So depending on your specific um, risk stratification, you could have a risk of PML anywhere from 0.1% up to around 1.3%. So people who have been on this medication longer, who are positive for a specific antibody called the JC virus antibody, and people who have been exposed to immunosuppressive therapies or chemo agents are gonna be at the highest risk. And that's anywhere from four years on, the risk is around 1.3%. The JC virus, just to clarify, that's called the John Cunningham virus. And what that is, is it's a very common virus, kind of like a cold virus that the vast majority of us have been exposed to in childhood. Um, statistically speaking, it's somewhere around 60 to 65 percent of the population carry a positive JC viral antibody status. For whatever reason, in our Tassabri treated patients, we see where that antibody that typically lays dormant, um, usually in the kidneys or the bone marrow, comes out. It circulates, it can mutate, and then it can get in the central nervous system and cause this virus called PML. Now, what we know is that everyone that's positive is not gonna go on to have PML, but it is something that we have to be aware of and monitor, especially in our patients that are positive for JC virus and have a history of immunosuppressive therapy with things such as Novantrone or methotrexate or cetoxan, emuran, cyclophosphamide, any of those products, rituxan, that we may have used that could potentially affect your immune system. Now the way this medicine works, and the reason, um, part of the reason that PML would come into play at a much higher incidence than what we see in other drugs, is this drug blocks the passage of your um, T cell lymphocytes through the blood-brain barrier. So by blocking that and keeping those cells out of the immune system, should you get a virus in there, you're not gonna have full force of your immune system. Now, there are other immune cells that can help fight virus and, and help in that situation, but the T cells are the ones that we see the vast majority of, and they're not gonna be able to cross um, the blood-brain barrier to get into the central nervous system. 
Now that's also why the drug is effective, because it's keeping those cells that do the damage out of the central nervous system. Um, really, from a side effect standpoint, outside of the risk of PML or the risk of infection, we don't get a lot of complaints from our patients on this medication. It's something that you get an IV infusion. It's given once every 28 days. It's given in a very specific infusion center. You know, this is not something that you can have your infusion at home like you may with steroids um, or IVIG. It has to be done in an infusion center that's been trained both on um, how to administer Tessabri as well as how to monitor for PML. Uh, while you're on this therapy, we're going to monitor certain things routinely. We're going to do some labs and watch your immune system. We're going to watch your JC viral antibody, and we're going to check MRIs routinely. Uh, MRI, if you were, God forbid, to come down with an infection such as PML, we can see that on the MRI. And there have been cases um, across the country of where people were caught to have and found to have PML before they were necessarily symptomatic. And that's through routine MRI monitoring. So that is something that we're going to monitor um, periodically while you're on this medication. So alemtuzumab. Alemtuzumab. Zimab is the newest monoclonal antibody to treat MS. Um, it was just released in November of 2000, and this says 14, but it actually was released in, yeah, 2014 by Genzyme. So it's been on the market for commercial use a little over a year. However, the studies were going on back to, I want to say 2005, 2006. So we have some data long-term from clinical study, however, um, just about a year on the market for commercial use. Now, this is a drug that was previously called CAMPATH. Um, it was used to treat certain forms of cancer, um, to treat some organ um, transplant rejection, and then we found out that it does offer benefit for MS. And the way we give this is it's an IV infusion that's given daily for five days and that's called month zero or the first cycle. 12 months later, we usually give an IV infusion daily for three days. Now, the vast majority of people in the clinical studies, that's all they required, and they did not go on to receive further um, infusions. However, there was some patients that required a third set, um, which would be another daily infusion for three years, or for three days at month um, two, or at month 24. So the third set of infusions. Now the way this medication works is it binds to the specific um, receptor cell on some of your lymphocytes and it destroys them, it depletes them. But after the depletion of those T and B cells, they regenerate. And the premises or the hope is that when they come back, they come back healthier and they don't come back with your traditional um, autoimmune component. So it's very important with this medication, I will say, that you get through the full cycle. So your first five-day treatment and then your second three-day treatment. Because it's after that second three-day treatment that we really see a large degree of the benefit. Now, issues with this medication, you know, it is a chemo. So we can see some um, infusion reactions, and it's pretty common. And I tell my patients, you're going to feel really bad for a week at least during your infusion and then some after that. But again, like some of the other products, we really can manage that. You know, we can pre-medicate you with certain things to try to minimize some of that, you know, infusion reaction. But that is a very common thing, and that's something that it's very important that you understand going in that it's not going to be like getting IV solumedrol. You know, this is, you're going to feel a little bit rough for a little while because of what the drug is doing. You know, it's tearing down those bad cells and then allowing them to regenerate. So infusion reactions are big. Um, obviously, anytime we use a product like this with the potency that it has, you know, we're getting a lot of benefit. The study looks great. The study data and, and some of the um, results that we see in the clinical studies. But there's also risk. So the risk that we see with this medication is we're going to monitor for other immune system issues or other autoimmunity, such as thyroid. The clinical studies, there was around 34% of people that did experience some thyroid dysfunction. So we monitor for that routinely. Um, other things that we can see is some decrease in the platelet counts or some um, 
some audio, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. The issue with that, if you were to lower your platelet counts, you're gonna run the risk of bleeding and you're gonna have some issues with that. So again, this is something else that we monitor very closely for. And the final major thing that we monitor for is some nephropathies of the kidney. So because of these potential risks, when you're on this medication, the most important thing to remember is you're tied to your healthcare professional for five years. So the big thing is four years after your final infusion, you have to have labs done monthly. And what we're gonna be checking is a CBC and urine as well as thyroid every three months. So we are monitoring for these, you know, these side effects that could certainly occur. Um, so this one's a big one, it's a commitment, but again, the data, you know, and looking at what the benefits are of any of these drugs is important. And the key is, you know, weighing out what's the risk and what's the benefit, and what's gonna work best with your degree of MS. Like Dr. Meckler talked about, some things require a little more potent medication perhaps than others, um, but it definitely has to be a decision, and it has to be a discussion that's had between you and your healthcare professional. Uh, and the key is making sure that you're educated on what's available so you can come into us and carry on that discussion and be able to talk with us about you know, what's going well with your MS and, and maybe what's not so that we can make the best decision for you. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. You did, that was a lot of information, I know, in such a short time, but you'll be able to ask questions at the end. Uh, our next presenter is Debbie Lockridge. Debbie received her bachelor's degree from McKendree College and just recently completed her master's degree. In addition, she has national certification both in MS and clinical research coordinators, coordination. The focus of her career has been on transformation nursing care to foster education and innovation, innovative holistic partnerships to meet the challenges of chronic neurological illness in our community. Debbie is a great resource for us in the office. She uh, does all of our MS research and actually sees patients and refers them on and not only takes care of the patient during um, research, but as the whole patient. Um, her topic tonight is, what is it time to change therapy? What do we consider breakthrough disease? Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everybody. Let's see, most everybody is, um, yeah, my fan club's over here. My squad is here. Um, I guess if these are the brains, I would like to be remembered as the heart and soul of MS treatment. I see a lot of folks in here that I've had the privilege to serve and know and spend time with over the years and um, a lot of new faces and I wanna welcome each and every one of you. I have some really important things to say tonight and I've got 15 minutes to do it in, so let's get rolling. When is it time to change therapy? How does this conversation even happen? For most folks, when you come in for a routine visit, you may ask about, am I on the right drug? Well, what about this drug? What about that drug? Is there something new out there? Is there something coming down the road that you think might be helpful to treat my condition? It may be a conversation that happens in the office. It may be a conversation that happens on the phone after your office visit. Maybe your MRI didn't look so good. Maybe you've had issues going on where you feel like that the medication that you're on is either causing so much of a problem that it's time for you to give up, or you're looking for something better, or you might even be looking for nothing at all. So let's talk about what that looks like. When you say you want the right medicine, what are you really trying to say? I want a medication I can take that works for me. I want at the end of the day, the outcome to be, yeah, maybe I'm not cured, but I can function. I can do what I need to do during the day. In the beginning, when the drugs came to market, you heard, oh, this drug reduces the relapse rate by 33%. It was like, yay, it works. 
okay? All the drugs were tested and went through clinical trials and were shown to be effective in terms of how your MRI looked or what your relapse rate was. Maybe it was based on ability to walk. Well, there was a new kid in town, and it's a term called NEDA, and the bar's been raised even higher for medications. Now what we're looking at is no evidence of disease activity. That sounds like a cure, right? Or pretty darn close. No evidence of disease activity doesn't mean your MS goes away forever. Boom, it's gone. What it means is that there's an extension of the time between relapses. The relapses when they occur aren't as severe. Your MRI looks okay. Your ability to do the things that you need to do to get through the day is stabilized. That's really raising the bar. That's saying a whole lot more than this drug will reduce your risk of a relapse by a third. So that's what we're looking at now as drugs come to the market. So back to how this question comes up. Well, there's a burden on your healthcare providers here because as you heard Jennifer so eloquently talk about, these are fancy drugs. They affect your immune system, sometimes temporarily, sometimes forever. Your immune system is one of the most important systems in your body. I guess I'd have to ask Dr. Meckler to explain how the immune system works because it's like a huge maze to me. There were so many things that do this and things that do that and this switches that on and that signals this that it's way over my head and way too complicated for me to understand. What I do know is that there's only one thing in the immune system, one piece of that puzzle that has to go wrong before you're in trouble. All of the drugs that have been talked about so far have an effect on a different piece of that puzzle or a different part of the immune system. If, you'd, if you've had MS for a while and you've been on several different drugs, obviously you've had more than one part of your immune system that's been impacted. The question then becomes, what were your expectations for the treatment when you got started? What makes you think that the medication's not working? Do you have other health problems? The conversation needs to be had, and I'm gonna be the bad guy here, that taking medication for MS doesn't make you a healthy person. If your diet's high in fat and sugar, that causes your body to be in an inflammatory state. If you smoke, we all know that's bad for MS. If you don't exercise, that's a problem too. Was my expectation when I started this drug that I was gonna be a healthy, normal person? I can't expect taking a pill or taking a shot or having an IV treatment to flip that switch and make me a healthy person. The medicine's gonna do its part. Yeah, it's gonna be effective, but I have a responsibility as a patient to pay attention to my health. What about my age? Is there anybody in here that started on beta serone in the 90s? Raise your hand. You've lived with MS for a long time. The conversation then becomes, when do I stop treatment? When is enough enough? Is it ever enough? We know that early in life that uh, MS